Welcome to Right on Track, a songwriting podcast. Thanks to Tone for tuning in. I'm Demi Michelle Schwartz, and I'm thrilled you're joining me on my songwriting journey. So kick back and relax, don't fall flat, and remember, stay right on track. everyone welcome back to right on track joining me today is mark evitz hey mark hey how's it going it's going great how's it going for you it's going really well i'm getting to talk to you awesome i am so excited you're joining me on the show today we have lots to discuss but before we get into all of the fun specifics can you share with the listeners a little about yourself and how you got started in the music industry yeah my name's mark evitz i uh i write music for TV and film. And, um, but I have kind of a deep background in writing music for different genres, uh, from jug band to old time, to bluegrass, to pop country, to being on Grammy nominated hip hop albums. I grew up in, um, a riverboat town, uh, called Paducah, Kentucky. And it's like halfway between Chicago and new Orleans. And, um, it's sort of this interesting musical town where you get like bluegrass, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, but it's also like country because it's only like two hours from Nashville. So it's like got this country thing, but you also have an intersection of jazz as well from like this like kind of riverboat uh, thing. And so I, I actually picked up violin, uh, which is my main instrument at a pretty early age then in high school, a really cute girl asked if I wanted to go to a fiddle camp. <laughs> and I went to this fiddle camp with her because I was like, hey, this is a cute girl. You know, I'm in high school now, so sure. So I went to this fiddle camp with her. And at that camp, I actually learned how to play a bunch of different genres um, and different styles. Like I, at that before then, I was just like a classical violinist. And um, I kind of learned a bunch of different styles of music. And um, really enjoyed that. Then in college, I met a really great mandolin player, a guy by the name of Chris Thiele, who um, really encouraged me to, to pursue music professionally. He was he now is in a band called or he had a band called the Punch Brothers and he had a band called Nickel Creek. And he he's had a lot of uh, success in his own right. And he, I really looked up to him. And so when he said, go do your own thing, I, I really took it. Uh, pretty seriously. And so I ended up moving to Nashville. I toured for years um, as a, as a fiddle player, mandolin, guitar, did some piano. Uh, and then I got into playing on records and um, played on a lot of, a lot of different styles of records. Again, just playing, you know, different, different genres and different things and uh, got me into writing music, producing music. And uh Yeah. That's amazing. You're such a well-rounded musician. I think it's awesome how you started with classical violin because I started with classical piano before I branched out into genre music and awesome. commercial music. Yeah. So I think that's amazing. So first, I want to dive deeper into your days as a touring musician. Do you have any favorite highlights from those days, maybe favorite venues or artists you've played with? Oh, sure. Um, so I started touring uh, my first like professional touring gig. I was straight out of high school i was 18 and i played with this guy named mark wills and he let me come out on the road i it, it had to have been a mistake i was like way too young to be doing <laughs> this but at, like at the level he, he had like a number one country record and the, the fiddle player couldn't make it and so he said hey can you sub for me this weekend and they let me come out and it was like a it was an amazing experience i got to ride on a bus for the first time and and um it, it was a really really great experience um yeah, I I did it for like 20 years, you know, touring, you know, just solid touring uh as a as a touring musician and um yeah, favorite venues, I got a chance to play Carnegie Hall, um which was a lot of fun. I played with like a a bluegrass group there. Um I've I've like spent time in Germany and Sweden. I actually toured in Stockholm for years uh with a with a Swedish group and that was super fun. Um, yeah. And I played like the, the one fun thing is, you know, before I think before the age of, I'm going to say 35, I'm 42 now before the age of 35, I had played in all 50 States. That's so crazy. that was, that was a lot of fun to be able to do that 
at a young young age. That's amazing. And I'm sure that, you know, growing up, you did that when you turned 18, you started. So just growing up in that touring environment, what were some of the obstacles that you faced when you're straight out of high school and then you're thrown into this touring? <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's, um, I, I, I've done just about it because I did tour like on a, my, well, one of the, the, the <laughs> I'd say the biggest struggle was I toured on like a huge tour right out of high school. And then that was a sub. And then I'm back to playing like backyard camp. Fires, <laughs> you know? So, so I, I've definitely done the whole, the whole gambit of, of uh, playing, you know, in, in Kentucky playing a, a fiddle for, for like a campfire too you know, playing, uh, for presidents, you know, so it's, it's, it's been the, the, like the, the whole entire gambit. Uh, biggest struggle for me was I, I have a son. And so once my son reached a certain age, I really, I mean, I missed him being gone, but once he was like, uh, you know, wanting to spend time with me and wanting to connect with me, the family aspect was like pretty tough. And ultimately you know, caused me to want to, to leave that and get into film, film composing and, and kind of, uh, it's not the reason, but it's, it's a, it was a big reason, like a career shift to, to just be at home with my son and, and be able to be there with him. That That's a big, the family struggle is, it was a real one, but at, at the same time, you know, it's like, I'm getting to, uh, I, I, a lot of people have it worse, you know, I mean, I'm getting to ride on million dollar buses with, with, uh, uh, screaming fans, you know? And so that, that's always a blast, you know, that's, that's a super fun aspect of it, but you do miss your, you do miss your family and you do miss your loved ones. And, and, uh, you know, I, I've missed a lot, uh, with it being through my twenties and thirties, I, I couldn't go to a lot of my friends' weddings, you know, like some of my best friends, I wasn't able to be there on the weekend to, to be there for their wedding. So it's that kind of rigor and schedule that, that, that's the tough part of it, but there's, there's a ton that's, that's great about it. That's for sure. Right now. And I really appreciate you opening up about that because I think people who have never experienced the touring musician side of things, they can look at their favorite artists and be like, God, they're living the life. They have right. everything they can possibly want, but you're saying what is super true. Like there's sacrifices that need to be made. You're not spending time with family, missing friends, weddings, and not really living a normal life. Like you're traveling <laughs> yeah. all the time. And so Yes, there's great moments and people put on this perfect public persona that everything's great, but there are definitely are struggles. So I always appreciate when musicians open up about that because it's not all perfect all the time. Exactly. You know, it's 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 um uh, it's really fun and it's great and there's there, that is why you do it. You know, you're doing it because you get to you get to meet new people, get to play great places and you get to do incredible work. But the 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 flip side of that coin is is that it's like you know you you are making a sacrifice, especially if there's like younger musicians coming up. You know, I I can't tell you I, I've spent the night in the back of a van. You know, it's yeah. like it's it's tough. You know, it's like you're 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 broke at first, and you you know you try, you got to work through it. But what if you stick with it and you you kind of you 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 develop friendships on the road that's like pretty incredible and um i i mean I, a, a drummer friend of mine just had a birthday the other day and i i can tell you i i spent so many birthdays with him because he wasn't able to be at home with his family yeah. so we were his family and so uh, it was it was great to like kind of see to just know when his birthday is and and to, to have those relationships right. years i'm not touring with him anymore but i still remember it and i still love the guy like he's my brother yeah so it's you do develop this like familial um relationship with those that you tour with for sure mm -hmm. absolutely for sure yeah and so another thing that you've done aside from the touring and being a studio musician is production you mentioned and for various genres as well so before you transitioned into the TV and film, I'm sure that doing production for all these genres definitely contributed to the composer you are today. So can you share a little about that? Absolutely. So um, I got, I was I it, probably in my 20s and I had been asked to um, play on an album over in Germany for this German artist. Um, her name was Lisa Marie Fisher and Lisa... Um, 
asked me if I would come to, well, we went to um, Zurich to record her album. And it was me and a bunch of like European musicians. But she really, she was a fan of a band that I was in called Oval Opus. And she was this big fan of my band. And she was like, hey, would you play fiddle and mandolin on my album? I'll fly you to Zurich. And oh I was my like, gosh. yeah. Sure. You know, yeah. Okay. I'm in, <laughs> you know? And so I fly to Zurich and, um, she was very young and very, uh, novice when it came to playing on records. And the, the band that she had hired was good. They were, they were, they were great, but they, they were just playing the songs, you know, like no, there was no leadership in that oh. role. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm like, there's no, no one's taking the helm here. Cause they, they don't really know. Like, they're like, are we repeating this chorus? What are we doing? And it felt like they were still struggling on the forms of the song and, and like, like, how do we, what, what do we do here? And I'm watching this like kind of not bickering, but just back and forth ideas that aren't going anywhere. And I, I um, came up to Lisa and I pulled her aside and I said, you don't have a producer. You don't have anybody, you know, kind of with a, with a vision for this. And she starts crying. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Lisa, what can I do to help? And she was like, can you please produce this? Because <laughs> I'm getting frustrated and she's young. And so I go, I will be your producer. And I literally <laughs> just said, this is what I'm going to do. And so I got in the control room. And I took the songs and I said, okay, Lisa, do we like this? And I start talking with the artists and I'm working with her. And I tell the guys, I'm like, let's take a break and <laughs> let's just figure out the songs. And I kind of took more of the producer role. And I said, okay, here's how we can get this accomplished. And then I conveyed that to the band. And I, I remember, this isn't a bragging story. It was just a funny ending to the story. I remember at the end of that day, the engineer literally hugged me and said, I didn't think we were going to get through this. Day. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> That's why I came up to you. So anyway, I ended up feeling like a like I had a strength in that. Like I had a way to talk to the artist and talk to um, and figure out like, what's the story they're trying to tell? These are these, this isn't just songs that we're recording for the fun of it. They, they flew me to Zurich. Like I need to, I, I need to take, we need to take this seriously and, and do this really well. And so anyway, I started, um, after that, her manager asked me if I would produce several songs for her or several songs for her. So I produced another album. I ended up producing like three albums for her and, um, kind of built up my chops for production with that. And I, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And because I live in Nashville, I'm just, I have a a treasury of incredible musicians. And so I can call upon my musician friends and say, Hey, here's what we're wanting to do. And it's, it's not like, Oh, I've got, um, one, I've got a great keyboard player. No, no, no. I have like, what specific style are you looking for? What are you looking for? So I, I've got this like, like really vast network of people that I can call upon to, to kind of get the artist vision across to where I'm, I'm, a little bit of a conduit to, to hearing what their story is, getting it across the finish line and saying, Hey, how can I help you get this to, um, what, whatever you're wanting that finished product to look like, but may not have like the skills to, to do it on your own. So, so I, I kind of stepped into that role for, for, I mean, I still, still do it, you know, it really, uh, it felt like a natural step for me to do that. What a story. That's, that's such a great story of how you just like <laughs> got thrown into it. Wow, that's great. And no, I can imagine, you know, being there and seeing the band just not having any sense of meter and like not playing to a metronome or anything. Like, right. I think that's one of the benefits of, you know, being classically trained is like my professors and teachers were like, you got to practice with a metronome. You have to. And so when I started recording music, like I can do piano takes in one take because I know what I'm yeah. doing and so yeah it's it's awesome and I think you know just I think it's amazing for any kind of musician songwriter composer to have some skills with production because I've started basically co-producing all of my stuff with my producer awesome. and once you understand the process it's so much easier to convey what you want and share your vision and help it come to life with the best people you can possibly work with and so yeah so I've got a question for you so you um 
you you're now co producer Did you have a producer? You had a producer at first that like, I do have worked- a producer still. You yeah. do have a producer. Okay, so this producer did he sort of like take on a a mentor role or how, what was that role for you? How, how did he, he how did he work? Yeah, so it was really great because when I started looking for a producer, the first couple I worked with were super just like okay, come in, lay down the track, you leave, I'll send you a mix, and it just oh. wasn't. Yeah, right no. for me because I wasn't getting what I wanted even with sending them reference tracks and so when I started working with my producer that I've been with for going on four years now we literally sit down and basically build everything from the ground up together I give them reference tracks I'm playing most of the instruments like if it's MIDI or we bring in some other musicians like guitar saxophone whatever we're using I play piano and it's just really great because he definitely took on a mentorship role like explaining what he's doing and why he's doing it like when I first Fantastic. started I was totally out of my element and I was like, what does a slapback echo mean? Like, what? Like, <laughs> like, I didn't know what anything meant. And like right. having him be so patient and explain the whole process. So oh, now like I'm in the sessions and I'm able to use the right language. And yeah, that's exactly it. That, that to me, like I, I my whole process is collaboration. Right. That's what I love. I love Nashville is a collaborating city. It's right. like everybody co-writes here. Everybody's like working together. There's not like a. Um, well, I mean, there is some people like, like kind of take, take over, but like, even with Lisa, like, I was just like, what do you want this to be? This isn't my album. It's, it's your album. How do we get this across? And so I love that your producer is doing that with you and that you now, because, because at the end of the day in producing my goal in, in creating music is that I, I, I'm just trying to tell a story Right. that, that I, if I play a part in that, that's fantastic. But ultimately like the artist or the studio whoever that that story that needs to be told it, it i i just want to help get it there i don't want to take over and say i'll send you a mix when i'm done <laughs> you know, that's like that's so that's that's not my vibe no. and I, I love that you're doing it on your own and that you're you're now have like the tools to kind of be like okay i see what they're doing i right. it, it, because music should be that i i think that it's it's speaking to each other it's a it's not just a monologue it's a dialogue right exactly and i think the other thing too is like my producer even said when i sent him send him demos he's like your demos now are like ridiculously better than awesome. at the beginning my demos at first were atrocious they were so bad and now like i <laughs> i know what i'm doing enough to really demonstrate like what i'm trying to convey fantastic the song. so yeah it's really really amazing um so now i want to shift gears and chat about your tv and film work so you shared a little about why you made the shift but what was it like for you musically to go from producing these pop and country and hip-hop and all of this into scores for tv and film yeah, so um, uh, several years ago, I got asked to do um, a documentary. I mean, it was a while ago now. It was like 10 years ago. I, I I got asked to score a documentary for a friend of mine that was directing it. And so I did. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue how to even start. <laughs> I just was like, here's the kind of music I would write. And I ended up writing like, I think like 25, 30 tracks and I gave it to the director and I said, can you use this in there? And he ended up like kind of putting it to picture the where I told him, I was like, here's where I would put this. Here's where I would do this. And I literally had no clue of what I was doing. So that started me on the journey of like really wanting to write to picture and like learn how to do it. I started um, taking, taking, cl- I went back to school, started taking classes at Berkeley to learn how to, um, to learn how to like write to picture. And Um, I, I really just, I I had this drive in me. I I was out touring and I started writing just, I was like, I just want to write music. That's all I want to do. And I started off taking like a laptop with me out on the road. That laptop turned into like eventually turned into like two suitcases worth of gear, a backpack and like all of this kind of stuff to where I would set up backstage and just write music all day and I was like writing to like like literally finding YouTube clips and just like writing to picture and just like how do I do this better and um spending all time with it to to the point where it was like kind of touring got in the way of my love for writing and I was like okay I gotta come off the road so I ended up coming off the road in 2019 and I did something that was like I think it's like the luckiest 
break ever. But I, I basically, I came off the road in 2019 and I said, okay, I want to start working with LA people. I need to learn how to use Zoom better. <laughs> and in in the fall of 2019, I got my rig at home set up to where I could do Zoom sessions. <laughs> now, if you do the math here, I was six months ahead of the curve <laughs> for COVID. And so I I had I had like gone out to um LA. I was like cold emailing and cold calling a bunch of composers. And there was a guy named Alex Garingas who um, wrote me back and was like, hey, do you think you can come? And I'm, I'm in Nashville and I don't tell him I'm not in L.A. He's an <laughs> L.A. composer. And I go, I go, hey, can I come out to Los Angeles and uh, meet you? I would love to take you to coffee. And he goes, come by the studio next Thursday. <laughs> and I literally booked a flight. I was like, OK, I'm in L.A. next Thursday. Booked a flight, flew out, met him. And it was funny because like when I met him, I was like trying to be this like, I'm going to be this like composer, not this like country boy from Tennessee <laughs> that plays on, you know, plays fiddle. So I'm like, I'm going to be this composer, you know, and, and I could tell like his eyes were kind of glazing over with like a little bit bored with my story, which is, which this is, I think, kind of important. And then I just dropped all airs and I was like, I'm just going to be me. I'm going to tell him that I'm a fiddle player from, from Nashville. To, so I did, I said, he goes, so what's your story, man? And so I'm like, I'm a fiddle player from from Nashville, Tennessee that plays fiddle, mandolin, guitar, grew up playing classical, now then play bluegrass, hip hop. I've done it. And he immediately was like, well, this is a way better story because it's you, you know, it's like <laughs> when you're telling your story, it's so much more interesting. And so he said, hey, I've got this movie I'm working on called Arlo the Alligator Boy, and it's on Netflix. It's a feature uh, animated film that's coming out on Netflix check this out. And it was this kind of like swampy country meets hip hop um, elements, this kind of young urban element meets like this kind of swampy this about this alligator from Louisiana kind of element. And he was like, could you write some music with me on this? I've got a couple things I started. You want to help me like finish them? And I was like, I'd love to. And so I sent him a couple of cues and he loved it. Well, then COVID happens. And he says, hey, man, I got a bunch more cues. Are you set up to do like Zoom? And I go, I'm your guy. On this. I've, been, <laughs> I, I've been ready for it. So I set up, um, I, I just kind of like, like was able to, to kind of like send him files, send him like ideas on stuff. And we started collaborating. And then uh, I signed to a, he has a, a company. Um, it's like a publishing company management thing. And he signed me to it. Uh, it's called Run and Gun, and I signed to that with uh, Jonathan Gordon, Brett Sin, Sam Hollander, and uh, all great uh, music industry people. And I signed to them, and then they got me a brief for uh, Apple TV's Frog and Toad, and I auditioned for that and uh, got it, got the got the gig. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, we're going to chat more about Frog and Toad in a second, but I first want to tell you that your whole story into getting into TV and film is super inspiring because the one thing is you were like, I'm going back to school to learn how to do this better. I have no idea what I'm doing, so I'm going to invest the time and work Absolutely. on my own and go to school. And I think that's amazing because you put in the work and you put in the hard effort to get there. And also the fearlessness of just like cold calling and emailing people. I could <laughs> never, I'm such an introvert, but I need to get out of it, but look where it led. And so I think that's a really great story because, you know, people think like, oh, there's so many gatekeepers, nobody will let you in. But this is a perfect example of you took a chance and you put yourself out there and look where you are now. 100% agree. My, my whole philosophy has been because I believe it or not, I'm actually like quite introverted. And I, <laughs> I, I really, uh, like I, I have a, I'm in my studio now and I, I rarely leave my studio. I, I kind of thrive, <laughs> you know, kind of the internal thrive thing. Um, but I, the one thing that like have, I've always done is I've always had this idea that, uh, preparation plus opportunity is going to equal success. If I'm prepared, if I'm well educated and I'm well if I've done my homework and I've got my thing, whatever that is, but as long as I've done my homework on it, if the opportunity arises, it's going to be successful because at the end of the day, I've presented myself to someone else. And, and the more that I do that, the more people I meet, the more I'm able to present myself, 
um, it, it's going to lead to a successful thing. And that, that's sort of been my whole career. I've, I've, when I was a classical kid, I used to practice like eight hours a day on violin. You know, I was like constantly practicing because, yeah. because honestly, like I'm not the greatest violinist there are in Nashville. I'm definitely not the greatest fiddle player, but I, I know who I am and I know my, my voice. And I'm like, the more I kind of lean into that, I'm like, well, this is, this is all I got, <laughs> you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Itchhock Perlman. Like I, I, I will never be that. And, and honestly, I don't want to be Itchhock Perlman. Itchhock Perlman is, is amazing. because <laughs> He had the influences he had. He had the, the idols that he, he had growing up, you know, yeah. it's like Hilary Hahn, who's an incredible violinist. She had her own influences and we all have our own influences. And if we, if we just lean into you, you you're a unique and individual person and and that's great yeah. and that's 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 who you are if you can harness that and harness your voice if if you just know how to to prepare and prepare to where your voice can be heard it, it's going to be successful you just got to stick with it yeah exactly perfect love that such great advice so more on frog and toad when i saw that you composed the music for it I was floored because I loved the books growing up so yeah did you have any kind of experience with the books when you got the brief or is it like oh what's this frog and toad about so um I did not I, <laughs> I had heard about the books growing up but I had never actually read them and uh thankfully my partner she actually grew up on the books mm. and her they were her and her dad's favorite books yeah. like like all-time favorite and <laughs> I in fact we had talked about frog and toad before I even got the brief for this because she like literally would say oh this is like the kite you know she would like bring up references from frog and toad <laughs> and so I had never read them but I I knew the the stories from her so when I got the brief I was like oh my god it's like frog and toad this is so cool <laughs> um I, my whole like kind of philosophy on that was like, I I'm going to let her kind of tell me her, her vision of it. But at the same time, I'm going to try to, how do I incorporate my background? How do I incorporate my history into this? It's it's actually kind of a cool, cool thing. I got the, the gig with frog and toad. Um, I actually, I was just hired as the songwriter originally. And each, each episode has like a little ditty in it. Um, little like a minute long, 45 second to a minute long ditty. And I was hired to write. And so I'd get the script and I'd see like they had like an outline of lyrics. Right. But I would um I would do that. So I wrote this kind of like, well, I'm gonna do like a jug band on this. They're, they're kind of this like kind of almost like cottage, you know, country kind of thing. Let me do what would a jug band sound like with this? <laughs> and so I kind of took that approach and I got the the job. Well, on song two, this is a wild story, but very true. On song two, I had just gotten this job and I was driving uh, down to New Orleans. I had a family vacation trip planned. I get to New Orleans and I write to to um, the the Apple and the production team and I say, hey, um, I'm, I'm in New Orleans for a few days. Just let me know if I'm going to, uh, if we, if we need anything right away, it might take me a second to, to get to my computer, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Well, Rob Hoagie, who was the executive producer of the, of the show, he writes to me privately and he says, Mark, I'm in New Orleans as well. I say, you're kidding. <gasps> no. I go, where, I go, where are you? And he tells me where he is. I am not joking one block away oh from my, my God. apartment. So we end up, I end up <laughs> going over to Rob's apartment and we're like having some gin and tonics <laughs> and I'm listening to like street musicians uh, play, like, like they're playing. And I look at Rob and I go, what if this was the sound of the show? Like, what if we did this? What if it's like individual instruments kind of off in the distance playing? And it's like this this kind of like jug band meets New Orleans, Dixieland, but we've got some like classical elements in it. What if it, and we start spitballing ideas <laughs> on, on the thing. And then um, it was great because by the time the score brief came around to, for the composer brief, Rob and I had already discussed what we wanted the show to sound like. So I had this opportunity to kind of like collaborate with Rob in like a sort of a New Orleans style writer's room. 
And we just are spitballing ideas and we created the, sh- the sound of the show together. That's the coolest thing ever. It's oh my so goodness. It's so cool. <laughs> it was so cool. And I, I don't, it, again, like luck had a lot to do with this. It's a, it's a, it's one of those things, but it's also the thing of like me just being vulnerable and, and open and saying like, here's what I think my voice could lend to this. Here, here's what I could do to help get this through. What do you think? What's your voice say? And it's this collaboration that, that really kind of defined mm-hmm. uh, the sound of it. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, such a great story. That's wild you were both in New Orleans. <laughs> it's crazy. It was wild. So just to wrap things up on the whole Frog and Toad adventure with the composing and the songwriting, what was your favorite moment of this whole experience? Hmm. Um, so pretty early on, um, during the song writing experience. So I had written the song and I had like demoed the song with my vocal. Um, and this was a song called the ice cream song. And it's, it's in, I think episode two. Uh, and, and I had written this song and again, it was me demoing the vocal. And then they get the, the, the guy that's, that played the character to sing it, you know, cause I, I kind of sang what I, here's, here's the way the melody goes, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was Tom Kenny who Tom Kenny is the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. Oh my gosh. So I'm sitting there <laughs> over a zoom session with Tom Kenny and I'm producing Tom Kenny's vocal. And he's like, incredible. Like he's <laughs> truly like incredible. And he's kind of riffing off with me. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is so wild <laughs> that I've got the guy that's the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants working. I'm work. I'm like producing his vocal, and it, those kind of moments don't get lost on me. Like I, I, I really, I, I don't. I, I'm like again. I'm a country boy from from Paducah, Kentucky, and I'm working with SpongeBob. Like what is what universe am I in right now? You know, and then so. It, it that was definitely a standout moment getting to work with the talent that they had brought on. And I got to work with a, a, a lot, a lot of them. And it was the talent level was so unreal, but it, it also caused me to that whole preparation thing. I'd have to be on my game because they were so good. I wanted to match that. I wanted to, I wanted to be, you know, their, their level as hard as that would be to do. I, I really worked hard to try to get to their expertise. Wow. Well, what an amazing experience. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you for an Emmy nomination. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So to wrap things up, can you share a piece of advice with any aspiring musicians? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Get to know people. Take them out to coffee. Take them out to uh, lunch. You know, listen to TV. Listen to music. Watch TV. And write music that's you get to know people write music and just share it be you share you and create 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 all the time and it sounds like that's what you're doing it sounds like you're like kind of kind of like doing that like Mm. where you're just writing and and you're creating and putting it out there yeah absolutely well it was an honor having you on the show please share with everybody where they can find you online and check out all of your work Thanks. Um, it was an honor to be here. My social media is at Mark Evitz, uh, M-A-R-K-E-V-I-T-T-S, at Mark Evitz, and it's pretty much on anything. Awesome. Well, it was lovely having you. It was so awesome getting to chat with you. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mark Evitz. And of course, until next time, stay, stay right, right on track. track.